Well, it's the Dynasty of the Useless everyone's been asking for at least one part of. I'm sorry for the delay with the Hydra Drive video taking so long to make due to its size and how much work I'm putting into it. Just to make the intro scene perfect, let alone the rest of the video proper, because lord have you seen the size of that archetype! But, for now, before we enter the Ocean of Season 2's worst deck by far, let's take a dip first into Season 1 of Yu-Gi-Oh! Brains for some small sets of bad archetypes, just to have a nice surprise appetizer before the main course. So during the Tower of Hanwai arc in Brains, Mr. Yusaku the Playmaker had to partner with Aoi, aka Blue Angel, and Go Unizuka in order to take down some members of the Knights of Hanwei in order to get to the tower and stop Revolver from accomplishing his terroristic deeds. One of the knights fought was Revolver's second-in-command, Spectre, who is debatably one of, if not the best character in Brains, and has an interesting deck to boot. Plus, he's a recurring duelist, so we'll have to save him for another series down the JST Gato pipeline. But as for the other three knights shown, those people were Dr. Genome, Byra, and Faust. A trio of lieutenants in Hanwei, just below Spectre and Rank, who each had a very small archetype that were immediately forgotten due to how underwhelming they were. Helix, with their cool design and wasted execution. Dark Mummy, with their lacking monsters, and the only reason they were used was because of virus traps anyway. And Motorworms, with use only as an engine to existing insect decks, unable to prop themselves up properly. These three archetypes only really set the stage for more and more weird archetypes in the run of Reigns, but sometimes that can be a blessing. I mean, when you start off Season 3 with a Lure Queen support, you are definitely off your rocker to some degree. With that said, welcome to the first Dynasty of the Useless triple feature, as we'll be going over these three sets one at a time and judging just how bad these decks really are, and what real-life techs one could use to make them work. Y'all know the drill by now, it's Dynasty time! To start in order of appearance, let's cover the first lieutenant scene in the show, that being Dr. Genome. Genome uses the Helix archetype, a tremendously small fiend archetype based on DNA and mutants, made up of two main deck monsters, two links, a spell, and a trap. In concept, this is quite the interesting deck if you only consider Deoxys your favorite Pokémon from being swirly and nothing else, but the execution is exactly that. It's a public execution. This stems primarily from the main deck only being made up of two level 5 fiends with a situational revival spell, and not much else to say. So let's see what went wrong in the splicing process with the first card of the deck, Helix Marmatroll. Marmatroll is a level 5 Dark Fiend with 2600 attack and 0 defense with the following effects. If there are no monsters on the field, you can normal summon this card without tributing by sending one Helix card from your hand to the graveyard. The first time you would take battle damage from an attack involving this card each turn, you do not. The main issue here is that Marmatroll needs no monsters period on the field to be summoned without tribute, and even then he still needs a Helix card sent from the hand to be cheated out in a very fair and slow way. While he can be cheated out through Mausoleum of the Emperors, as well as Sinister Yori Shiro and the Monarch Stormforth, do you really want to waste such cards just for this? It's more along the lines of trying to fix your problem of running out of pencil lead by owning a graphite refinery. You're, you're doing too much for too little. That's really the main issue in a nutshell. This deck needs outside support to even do the basic plays, especially if forced to go second. If Marmatrol was given a better effect to summon itself, then maybe it could see a lot of use for being a dark equivalent of Galaxy Soldier. But otherwise, this is a card better off taken out of the gene pool. Next is Helix Dreadrat, another level 5 Dark Fiend with 1200 attack and 2000 defense, with the following effects. If you control a Link monster in the extra monster zone, you can normal summon this card without tributing. If this card is in your graveyard, you can special summon this card, but banish it when it leaves the field. You can only use this effect of Helix Dreadrat once per turn. You cannot normal summon or set the turn you activate this effect. The main problem with both of these monsters is that you can read through their effects and feel as if they were going to be better than they actually are. If you control a Link, you might as well just summon this thing from hand inherently, right? It's basically a Gilosaurus at that point, but you can tack on sending a Helix from your hand to the graveyard on this thing and not Marmatrol if that would make it seem more balanced, especially considering it can revive itself from the grave easily. Well, easily revive itself once per turn, get banished when it's linked away, and limits your normal summoning and setting for that turn, essentially cutting off access to literally the only other monster in the main deck, but it revives itself nonetheless. The idea of having to normal summon your big tribute cards kind of only works now with cards like the New Age Monarchs, and that's with literal years of support and an incredible structure deck propping them up. This has six cards. Well, that was the card reviewing equivalent of chemotherapy, but how do the links fare? Surprisingly well, if you forget the tiny little detail that you need the above cards to even summon them, but let's see if they make the trip worth it. Helix Gothic Clone is the first link of the archetype and is a Link 2 Dark Fiend monster with arrows going up and down. Zero attack and the summoning requirement of two Helix monsters. These are its effects. At the start of the damage step, if this card battles an opponent's monster, this card's attack becomes equal to the attack of that face-up opponent's monster until the end of this turn. 
The first time this card would be destroyed by battle each turn, it is not destroyed. If this effect is applied, after damage calculation, you can tribute one monster this card points to. Inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack the tributed monster had on the field. As stated before, the main issue is that the Lynx takes specifically the Helix monsters to make, so it really puts into question just how useful they are. While they can be solid in the effects department, when the only way to get materials is through two level 5 fiends that make Garbage Lord regret his choice in name, you aren't going to be turning any heads. Apart from this, Gothic Clone is fine as a standalone monster as he's kind of a Link you bell given it clashes and burns back damage by that of a monster it points to. It's a decent start to the Lynx, which is a shame given the fact that there isn't much else to go off of. Helix Necro Darwin is also a Link 2 Dark Fiend monster with arrows going up and to the left. 1800 attack, and the summoning condition of two Helix monsters to make. Its effect states, Your opponent's monsters cannot target this co-linked card for attacks. If this card is in your graveyard, you can special summon this card to a zone a Link monster points to. When your opponent activates a card or effect that would inflict damage to you, quick effect, you can make that damage to you zero, then this card's attack becomes double its original attack until the end of this turn. Archetype locked or not, this card is one of the most ridiculous ideas in the middle of Link format one could have. If you remember Firewall Dragon, you remember easy loops with Cannon Soldier to beat your opponent in a single turn. Now imagine this card constantly reviving itself just because you have any Link monster with a half-decent arrow. You can recreate Frog FTK without the frogs. Incredible! Yu-Gi-Oh! Brains is possibly one of the worst series for deck building the franchise has ever seen, considering there were two people with cards that could easily infinitely loop their opponent for game, and neither of them ever stopped to think, wait, where does it say once per turn on this card? Once again, though, it's archetype locked, and, as I have surely bashed into your heads by now, Marmo and Dreadrat are just garbage. This isn't even a perk to the archetype, having such a broken link, as it could be used with dangers, three Dreadrat to use the normal summon and the graveyard resurrection effects, and a cannon soldier. If consistency sounds like an issue, you can just have Saryuja and your problems are no more. It's like saying Toons were meta because Toon Cannon Soldier was a part of consistent FTK, or saying your entire family is smart because your big sister went through college. That's just not how any of this works. Helix cards are awful with one good egg, and by that I mean viable and not of moral quality. When it comes to talking about the spells, we can't as there is only one. When it comes to talking about spell, however, we can certainly. And quickly at that. Graveyard Incubation is the only spell of this archetype, a normal spell card with the following effect. Target two Helix monsters in your graveyard with the same name. Special summon them, but change their attack and defense to zero. They have their effects negated, they cannot attack or be tributed. Also, they cannot be used as material for a summon, except the Link summon of a Helix monster. You can only activate one Graveyard Incubation per turn. Oh yeah, this card gets the hard ones per turn, huh? Graveyard Incubation is such a heavily limited card given it negates the effects, has to be two Helix of the same name, makes stats non-existent, but who cares about that when it's just an easy way to get out your spammy Link Darwin? It's terrible if you want to do literally anything else, but it makes for the only good card in this deck, so it's an instant 3 up for dedicated FTK builds. As for the trap card, well, Regeneration Cure is a normal trap with the following effect. When your opponent activates a card or effect that would inflict damage to you, make that damage to you zero, then special summon one Helix token. If you go against most decks, this does nothing. Against Trick Stars, you will die, but at least you will have little buddies on the field to watch you burn. If this was a continuous, it would be bad, but as a normal trap card, this is embarrassing and a great way to sum up the entire archetype. Awful. So, final thoughts on Helix. The deck has a solid concept in terms of pitched idea, but the way it goes about doing this makes it seem like Lynx existed in 2006. They are heavily reliant on going first and praying to get a Marmotrol in the opening hand, or getting a card to circumvent its awful summoning condition. But even then, this deck fails to do anything aside from FTK in the same boring way we saw from Firewall, so there isn't even originality here. If the deck was more based on level 4s with the same effects as the actual monsters shown, if it didn't have the infinitely reviving Link fodder, this entry would have been a lot more positive. Maybe it wouldn't have even made it onto the show. However, there is only one card worth thinking of here, and it would be banned immediately if it was in real life. And it's a shame, because the artwork in this archetype is pretty neat, and I do like the idea of DNA as an archetype. But there wasn't even an idea of evolution, or splitting into multiples, or anything here that would symbolize DNA. It's just a cobbled together mess of flavor fails loosely based on mutants that fail in the end of the day. And now, from the most useless of the trio, to the one with the most potential to be terrifying to face against. Which is like saying we're going from Ebola to the plague, but that's where we are right now. We come to the Dark Mummies! Dark Mummy is the archetype belonging to Clarissa Turner, also known as Byra. The theme of this deck is using virus traps in order to stun assets of the opponent's deck and turn their benefits against them. Of course, kind of hard to do when your deck does so little upon the idea, but the prospect of new virus trap cards scares me given we have Lair of Darkness and all the shenanigans their field spell has caused. Byra's main opponent was Owie and her trick stars, to which she did manage to hold her own until Owie flipped the table. Last thing before we get to her cards, 
Myra has some of the funkiest cards ever shown as random fodder, and it's hilarious. She runs Temple of the Kings for her virus traps, as well as cards like Infected Male, Giant Germ, and Dikibio Drakmord, from what we are shown as she discarded them. I have no clue what these cards could be doing to help her, considering they all just seem to be flavor. Anyway, let's get into the monsters. Dark Mummy Probe is the first monster, a level 1 dark zombie monster with 700 attack and 0 defense with the following effect. If a card is in the field spell zone, you can special summon this card from your hand. Then destroy one card in the field zone. Probe is kind of situational, and yet it's a decent counter to field spell users. Note that if there are no monsters on the field, it does work as a mystic mind counter, funnily enough, as it does activate in the hand and then summons and pops. Sure, they can chain Ojamatrio, but mine still dies, so whatever, your deck can function again. It's funny how completely silly, irrelevant cards are getting noticed just because they counter the mine. It's like Necro's side decks all over again. Nothing else more to say here, as it's kind of basic otherwise, and it was used by Byra in order to get rid of Light Stage exclusively. Next is Dark Mummy Infuser, another level 1 dark zombie with 0 attack and 500 defense with the following effects. If this card is normal or special summon to a zone a zombie link monsters points to, you can target one of those zombie link monsters. While this card is face up in the main monster zone, that monster is unaffected by trap effects. Your opponent's monsters cannot target this linked card for attacks. Infuser is not the best, as all it does is make your zombie link immune to virus traps, including your own. However, for what it does, it's a solid monster. Could have used a special summon condition, then it would have been a much better example of something you could actually use in this deck. As it stands, you still run three given what we're building up towards, so that's how you know we only have the best of the best selection when trap protection is an absolute staple. Dark Mummy Surgical Forceps is the boss of the archetype, being a Link 3 Dark Zombie, with 2400 attack and arrows going up, right, and bottom left, requiring three Dark Mummy monsters to make, and has the following effects. Gains 300 attack for each monster it points to. When you draw a trap cards, you can reveal one of them, inflict 500 damage to your opponent. Once per turn, if a monster is normal summoned, special summoned, or set to a zone an opponent's Link monster points to, quick effect, you can destroy that monster's. Forceps is cool and all, but the issue comes from its materials, and the effects are not helped by its arrows. Your opponent can basically just not summon to that specific zone for a while, until they have their negation set up, and then proceed to not worry about forceps. The burn is cute and may have some loop with it, but I couldn't find anything consistent in testing. You need a specific spell we'll cover next, or the case of three probe in hand to pop a field spell on both sides, and then normal summon one just to bring it out. Honestly, the biggest hurt comes from a lack of dark mummy monsters in general. Otherwise, it's a decent link, albeit under-supported as a result. Monster Restitch is the only spell we'll be talking about, and it's a normal spell with the following effect. Tribute 1 Dark Mummy Monster. Special Summon 3 Dark Mummy Tokens. Alright, that one was clean and simple. Restitch is such a strong token gen spell, it almost holds this deck together. Tributing 1 for 3 tokens in a game where tokens grew a lot in strength is impressive, alongside no downsides like that of Scapegoat. As well, there is the fact that it's not once per turn, so you can turn 1 Dark Mummy into 5 tokens with 2 Restitch in hand, as well as turn that single Dark Mummy into a sizable board in the end. Always run three in a Dark Mummy deck, maybe just play a deck you want to play anyway and tech in a Mind Destroyer in this, see how that works. Now we're into the viruses, and I'm almost excited! Current Corruption Virus is a normal trap with the following effect. Tribute one Dark Monster with zero defense. Until your opponent's third end phase after activation, change the attack of all monsters your opponent controls with 2,000 or less defense to zero. They have their effects negated, also monsters in your opponent's hand cannot activate their effects. Current Corruption is a strong virus trap, given it hits decks where it hurts with no hand traps for those three turns, and monsters of 2,000 or less defense getting their effects negated. Not to mention Lair has plenty of zero defense monsters to benefit from. It's ridiculous, and it's powerful. What else more is there to say? You should run this thing in a virus-centric deck list, and even here, just because your tokens have zero defense and you can stop your deck from dying to hand traps, at least for a little while. Root Ransom Virus is also a normal trap card with the following effect. Tribute one dark monster with zero attack. Change the attack of all Link monsters on the field to zero, also they have their effects negated. Each time a Link monster is Link summoned while this card is in your graveyard, change the attack of all Link monsters on the field to zero, also they have their effects negated. During your opponent's second end phase after this card was sent to the graveyard, banish it. Root Ransom is just as powerful as current, although harder to get off in an actual lair deck without using the lair effect for making random zero attack monsters you have in the darks. Otherwise, the fact is, this leaves such a curse on Link monsters it's insane. Not to mention Root Ransom is bugged on Percy to sometimes affect players for the entire duel. It's hilarious to mess around with, and I definitely run this in a lair deck looking to troll. No joke, this card would straight up be used in our current meta, and would probably be a card that gets hit on the ban list, depending on, depending on how hard this card is abused against basically any deck ever made. What do Salamangrates do against this thing? Wait? 
So, final thoughts on Dark Mummy, and I guess Virus as well. The Dark Mummy archetype, as stated before, definitely has potential behind it, but sadly has plenty more issues. The main issue is that the three Dark Mummy monsters we have are two weak level 1 monsters, and a Link 3 that just needs one spell that's unsearchable to actually properly summon it, with better options for Link summons, moving it from cute to never seeing play. For anyone who wishes to give these a whirl on Dueling Book or something through customs, you have a solid base with them being zombies as well as Lair of Darkness, can work to hilarious degrees with the virus traps, which were more brought up to make sure we had enough to talk about as they are not bad cards, just not exactly a part of Dark Mummy. However, what holds it back is the lack of their own cards given the set is four cards if we take out the viruses. I'd also enjoy seeing these fully developed given that we have plenty of mummy-based cards, but never a full-on archetype of them, unless you want to bring up a few umbral horrors. Now that we've unwrapped these cadavers, let's enter the nest of the Motor Worms! Finally, we come to Yusaku's opponent of the trio, the man known as Aso in real life and Faust in the virtual world. Motor Worm is... a very unique light insect archetype, to be quite honest, and it's pretty fun regardless of the many, many issues that we'll get into. The main drawback is being reliant on certain cards in a quote-unquote pure Motor Worm deck just for it to function, but when it gets going it can be a force to be reckoned with. So let's get started with a Link, Link Monster. Uh, yep, there's no main deck here. So pure is not a word we can use to describe this deck, probably. Motor Worm Spreader Queen is a Link 3 Light Insect with 1000 attack, arrows going left, bottom left, and down, and requires two or more insect monsters to make with the following effects. Gain 700 attack for each insect monster on the field. Once per turn, if this card does not point to a monster, quick effect, you can special summon one Motor Worm token to your zone this card points to. Your opponent's monsters cannot target Motor Worm tokens for attacks. So this is probably one of the weirder starts to an archetype. Yes, there are no Motor Worm main deck monsters. Instead, Faust uses a few cards we will see coming up to make tokens for Spreader Queen. I guess including Spreader Queen herself. Thankfully though, it's generic in terms of an insect link so you can plug it in any sort so you can plug it in any kind of main insect deck out there, go nuts with insectors, or turn Ballpark into an OTK deck. As for the effect, it doesn't seem to do much on the surface. Spawns a token and gains attack. However, the support cards are what brings this queen to be a strong monster in the end. Oh, you thought there was any more? Nope, it's just spells and traps from here! Woohoo! Wormhole Defense is a continuous spell with the following effects. When this card is activated, special summon one Motor Worm token in defense position. If this card in the Spell and Trap card zone and or an insect type monster you control would be destroyed by battle or card effect, you can destroy one Motor Worm token you control instead. Your opponent cannot tribute insect monsters they control, nor use them as materials for a Link Summon. So here's the first card Faust used for the Motor Worms, and what can I say? It's a token gen on activation, and it's protection by sacking your tokens. As well, that part at the end. Your opponent cannot tribute insect monsters they control, nor use them as materials for a Link Summon. Remember when I brought up the idea of purity not being a thing? Well, you need DNA surgery. That's the end all be all. The payoff for this is a more competent version of zone blocking that Ojama's tried by blocking zones with tokens that cannot be used for links, which is the main out to Ojama Trio and Duon field effects anyway. Of course, it does have the issues of not accounting for synchros or fusions, but it's the Frains era in Season 1, so other extra deck methods were not common until Season 2, so the writers just decided not to care about them. Despite this, Defense is a great card and should be run at 3 in this deck. But one token isn't enough to make the queen, so let's move on into Motor Worm Bait, a normal spell with the following effect. If you control an insect monster, special summon two Motor Worm tokens. You cannot normally special summon level three or four monsters the turn you activate this card. Little specific, but otherwise, it's just Worm Bait, but the tokens are light. Nothing much more to say, given it helps get tokens for Spreader Queen to get buffs and summon it. Running at the same intervals as Worm Bait itself, the card might as well just say, no, oh, Worm Bait, again. Motor Worm Gate is the last spell of this set and is a continuous spell card with the following effect. Once per turn, if all face-up monsters your opponent controls are insect type, minimum one, you can target one insect monster you control, it can attack directly. Probably the most situational card in the set, Gate feels like a bygone mechanic of the GX era. Of course, this also ties into the Ojama idea of blocking the opponent with tokens galore to go for a big swing directly with Queen. Fun note in this is that it's a permanent buff to the monster targeted. So it's pretty strange as a result, especially for DNA surgery hilarity. Run one or two if you want to have some fun here and there, but it's completely unnecessary if you just want to do some link spam and hope for the best anyway. You might as well just run Fairy Meteor Crush. Egg Clutch is a continuous trap with the following effects. If an insect monster or monsters is special summoned to your field, you can target one monster in your opponent's main monster zone. 
change it to face-up defense position, and if you do, it becomes insect type. Also, it has its effects negated. While this card is face-up on the field, that monster cannot change its battle position. When that monster leaves the field, destroy this card. Once per turn, you contribute one insect monster, special summon up to two motor worm tokens to your opponent's field in defense position. So egg clutch is where the big plays come in for the zone blocking. You use this trap in order to block the opponent's monsters via summoning your own tokens to negate their effects, and make them insects that Queen gains from and can attack directly over. Sadly, it does not work for Lynx, but otherwise, pretty neat form of stun. As well, the tribute one of your own insects to get two blocking tokens on their end. It's great, I'd run this as three as its core part of the Motorworm playstyle. A finicky and unstable playstyle, but hey, we actually kind of see where this one's going, so that's a Swiss flag for you. Our final Motorworm card, and the end of this set, is Worm Revival, a normal trap with the following effects. Target one Link 3 or lower Insect Link monster in your graveyard. Special summon it, and if you do, it cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects this turn. Also, you can special summon one Motorworm token to your zone it points to. Worm Revival is decent, but slow and situational form of revival. You use this in order to get back Queen to a main monster zone for the stun with Egg Clutch, as well as spawning another token that you can sack for more blocks on the opponent's side. As well, it does have uses as a revival for other insect links and spawning a token as a new material, which is perfect for Giant Ballpark if they want to get their Picafina back and ready to use. Just in general, it's the little things that make this card solid in the end, even if it's not the best in the archetype it's supposed to be used in. Final thoughts on Motorworms, huh? Well, they're alright? The main issue is that you really need a different insect deck to be in the main deck for Motorworms to do anything other than, well, crumble. They don't form their own deck. Otherwise, you get a Link 3 monster, a handful of insect ton... a handful of insect token spawners, and a focus on blocking zones that needs a continuous spell to make sure you're not benefiting the opponent to an offensive degree. I mean, hell, a lot better than the Ojama tokens in today's day and age. I'd say mess around with this in the ballpark deck and see what comes from it. So that was the triple feature. To wrap this up, Helix. This set really needs better cards at the end of the day. Level 5s for Lynx is not good by any means. Level 4 and lower monsters and better support cards would be highly appreciated, and fix their stupid generic FT case that could actually be printed and not just see another card hit on the ban list immediately upon release. Dark Mummy. Like Helix, Dark Mummy needs more main deck monsters and maybe more ways to interact with the virus traps, maybe search them, do something on their own, that sort of deal. They're zombies, so they're solid in that regard, but when your type is the only thing you have going for you, you're more of a basic Tinder girl than a Yu-Gi-Oh archetype. Motorworms. No main deck monsters at all, and dependent on the kind of insect deck you build around them. Not to mention the absolute need for wormhole defense for the lockdown to even function, and it's not even searchable.